Okay. Right, well, I'm going to uh, share my screen and open the uh, session then. <laughs> Right. Can you see my uh, my screen? Okay. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So, welcome to uh, this afternoon's session uh, entitled "Shock and Archaeology: Learning from the Ariadne uh, Portal." Ariadne is a infrastructure uh, project associated with ERIS and though thereby with uh, Shock, and we represent sort of one of the user communities. That shock is reaching out to. Uh, just to remind you of the housekeeping rules, the session is being recorded. Uh, well, we'd say stay mute and keep your video off. I don't think since there's so few of us, I don't think you need to do that. Uh, that you can ask questions in the chat throughout the session. Um, so we just have got two papers. First of all, my colleague Holly Wright, who's ADS International Projects uh, Manager, will introduce the Ariadne uh, project and uh, particularly talk a little bit about the community building work and the user needs work we've done in Ariadne. And then I will um, uh, say a little bit about the work which we've been doing on aggregating archaeology within Ariadne, which in some ways is a, is a microcosm, I think, of what the EOSC hub is trying to attempt and, and uh, shows some of the issues in pulling together which even in archaeology is quite heterogeneous data. And then hopefully we'll leave a bit of time for questions and discussion if there are any. Uh, so uh, that's all by way of introduction. So I'm now going to uh, hand over straight away to uh, Holly. Very strange message. One moment, sorry. Right. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Is that full screen? Uh, not yet. You're not seeing it full screen. Not, not no. seeing it in presenter mode, no. What about now? That's it. Yeah. yeah. Is that all right? Okay. Don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> Did the exact same thing? Don't know. Um, right. So. I'm going to minimize this so I don't have to stare at myself. Um, right, so as Julian has said, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of shock and archaeology and the things that uh, we're learning from the Ariadne portal. And just to um, just to give a little bit of background, um, so essentially, the uh, Julian and I are from the Archaeology Data Service, and uh, just to give a sense of kind of uh, where we are coming from, um, and Julian, of course, is our is our director. Um, the Archaeology Data Service we we were set up in 1996, and I'm stealing Julian's anecdote that that is two years before Google <laughs> for um, for perspective of how long we've been around. Uh, we are based uh, in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York in the UK, and we are a domain specific archive. And we've recently acquired the Court Trust Seal, which we're really really excited about. Um, our mission is uh, supporting research, learning, and teaching with free, high quality, and dependable digital resources. And as an OIS compliant digital archive, obviously we do that through preservation, but we also, um, and 
Uh, we also make everything freely and openly available online, uh, but we also act as an aggregator for the UK for many other uh, actually larger and smaller organizations to aggregate their archaeological data. And then we also feed that data uh, into even larger aggregators, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we also provide guidance and support for the data creators, so uh, for the archaeologists doing the research uh, in the forms of our guides to good practice, um, but we also participate in research, so we are partners, uh, and in this role we are one of the partners in SHOC uh, representing uh, archaeological data, um, but we are also um, the deputy coordinators for Ariadne and Ariadne Plus. So uh, Julian gave you a little bit of information about what Ariadne is, but just to further reiterate, um, we are now in the second phase of Ariadne, which is Ariadne Plus. Uh, the first phase um, was an FP7 infrastructures project where we had uh, 17 partners representing 13 countries. And in that instance, it was fairly divided, fairly evenly divided between uh, the archaeologists, the data providers, and the uh, technical uh, partners to create um, to create the infrastructure. Um, it was 17 work packages, and there were quite a few uh, just research-based work, work packages, but the primary deliverable was the uh, collection level metadata aggregation portal or the area the portal. Um, the coordinators are, uh, as long in addition to us being the deputy coordinators, but the coordinators are um, PIN at uh, the University of Florence at Prato. So currently, we are about halfway through the second phase, uh, which we're calling Area Ne Plus. Um, this time, it's 41 partners representing 27 countries. Uh, and this time, it's much more um, archaeological partners, much more trying to expand our work with the data providers. Um, and part of that was uh, because we were able to very much build on uh, what Ariadne created in terms of the technical infrastructure that was found to be uh, sufficiently sound that we were able to, to continue on and expand that. Um, but it also expend, uh, extends Ariadne in a couple of different uh, directions. So for example, uh, we're much more interested in heritage science data, uh, trying to incorporate that into uh, archaeological data um, and the data types that that represents. Uh, but we are also, um, uh, we've also completely changed the back end. So this time uh, Ariadne is entirely built on uh, linked data, which was not the case in the first iteration. Um, and uh, we're trying to focus on a variety of innovative ser services and also trying to make sure that we very much embed uh, Ariadne within the EOSC. So just so you can see kind of the geographic coverage in the first, uh, first phase of Ariadne, um, we had quite good coverage across Europe, but you can see in the second phase now we have, we have really quite strong coverage across most of Europe. Uh, we also have three extra European partners uh, in the US, Japan, and Argentina. And the way Ariadne has been structured is using these sort of four points all working together. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about kind of the networking aspects of the research and innovation. Julian's gonna talk more about the technology uh, and how it relates to research and innovation uh, in just a moment. Uh, but just to, to give a little bit of background um, in terms of networking, uh, we've been working really hard to extend and support the, the Ariadne uh, community. And we very much are a community and I, I, we've, we've certainly suffered <laughs> from not being able to see each other in person and work together in person, um, but we have managed to continue on um, and, and meet our project deadlines despite COVID, uh, but very much looking forward to when our community can come together uh, again properly. Um, we are working as a community to establish uh, policies and good practice for data, uh, for our data, including uh, making sure that the FAIR principles are, are core to that. Um, integrating archaeological uh, data sets. Um, Julian is going to talk much more about this, but the idea here is that we're, we're doing this um, communally together to develop our data models, um, develop our standards and documentation, um, and then extending the data infrastructure uh, with all of the things that <laughs> that requires data cleaning, things like that. Uh, but once again, making sure that we stay aligned with, uh, with the EOSC services. 
Um, in terms of technology, very much uh, the same thing, focusing on it, basically creating an Ariadne cloud um, for the infrastructure and portal. Um, in the first phase of Ariadne, uh, we worked very much at the collection level. We had a couple of case studies where we worked at the item level for data integration, but this time we're very much trying to do that more, allowing federated queries uh, across uh, item level data to really open up what some of these collections hold. Um, the, uh, in terms of just managing it, as I said before, um, it's all linked data this time around, but we're also uh, deploying uh, various VREs. And in fact, the entire Ariadne project, um, our community, we have a, a VRE on D4 Science where we use that as our communication platform and that works very well. Um, in terms of the uh, creating our knowledge management systems, uh, we're all working as a community to do to do that together, and then uh, a variety of, of uh, new services that we're trying to put in, which I'll talk about more uh, in a minute, as well as uh, different uh, innovative uh, work on innovative methods and a couple of new pilots, which again I'll talk more about in a minute. I'm not going to talk uh, very much about innovation and impact, apart from saying that we have done some really deep work in this area, um, including the Ariadne Plus Innovation Strategy, which is um, trying to ensure that we Ariadne has the impact that we want and, and that is sustainable impact. Um, here is the URL if you would like to have a look at any of the reports, uh, deliverable reports that we've created. As I say, these are very, <laughs> very long, very deep um, uh, looks at things like innovation strategy and they are all uh, publicly available. So you're very welcome to go to the Ariadne website and, and download those. So now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the work that we've been doing around surveys and community needs. Um, essentially, the, uh, we, well, we were able to do a really in-depth uh, user needs survey in the first phase of Ariadne. So this would have been in 2013. And we've just been able to do it again uh, last about this time last year for 2019. And uh, what's great about this is that means we can start looking at things in ways that are comparable and start seeing trends across uh, the archeological data community. Um, so essentially we've been looking at uh, attitudes towards data sharing, access and reuse, what people want, um, what people don't want, what kind of training they feel that they need. And you can see on the right, there are a couple of uh, different uh, pie charts to show you kind of what sort of um, domains we've been uh, hearing from. Um, we were very careful to actually separate out and have two different types of surveys. So one is for archeological researchers, for the people who are the data creators, as well as the data users, and then separately talking to data managers and providers. And in some instances that actually meant uh, individual interviews. Um, this time around, we had four, 484 usable uh, questionnaires that came back to us. Um, and these, this is international. This is from absolutely uh, around the world. So um, we feel fairly confident that we've got a quite a good sample. Um, and, and as I said, it's been really nice that we've been able to compare uh, 2013 with 2019. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we learned in 2019 primarily. Um, but that entire in-depth look at the differences and what we found out are reported in Deliverable 2.1, which is found in the um, URL that I had in the previous slide. So please do take a look at it if you're interested in user needs. Um, and of course, the main purpose of this is to use as a basis for what we are going to develop for Ariadne Plus. So just uh, quickly, these are the incredibly diverse types of data that archaeologists uh, produce and deal with. Um, Julian's going to talk more about why archaeology is such a great case study uh, for all of the kinds of uh, data that may go into, into EOSC, so I won't dwell on this, but uh, it really is astonishing that we've got everything from isotopes to uh, engravings on megaliths. So it's wonderful. Um, so for data sharing and reuse, some of the interesting points. So basically, here are just you know, three of the three of the questions that we asked uh, in our user needs survey. Um, 
the first one is really interesting because in comparison to 20 to 2013, 65% up from 50% sh say that they are now sharing uh, from some or all some or all of their project data in some kind of uh, accessible repository. So that is really good. That is really positive. Um, but unfortunately, what that means is it's almost certainly going to be a synthetic field work report, um, not the underlying data itself. And actually, we've still got quite a bit of, of work to do, but, but generally positive. Um, the number of people who are reusing open research data alongside their own research data is 63%. And that's really, really significant, I think. Uh, and, and just in terms of perception, the increase over the last five years of people realizing, okay, sharing our data is something that we really need to do. Um, that, I mean, that perceived increase was 83.2% felt that that was an important thing. So we are really starting to get the message across, which is great. So this is, this is really interesting. Um, a lot of it is exactly what you would expect in terms of what people said were the barriers to deposit, uh, their, to depositing their research data in a digital repository. Um, interestingly, even though it's still 62%, uh, 60, 59%, sorry, because um, usually the answer is sort of it's about money and, and at 59%, it's obviously not about entirely about money. Um, when we look at what is the biggest barrier at 75.5%, a lack of professional recognition and reward for open data sharing. So we really, what this has told us is that we really have a lot of systemic work that we need to do if we're gonna make progress in any of these areas in terms of actually practically um, coming up with incentives for people to make their data open. Uh, that's that's gonna be a whole professional shift that we're gonna have to work on and it is the biggest barrier, which is fascinating. Uh, also, um, one thing that was really heartening is that in terms of training needs, uh, the top training need that, that, was, uh, that came out of the uh, survey was that uh, people want to be able to apply fair data principles to their data, which means that they know what fair data principles are and that they uh, realize that they are something that is important. So I won't, I won't dwell on that anymore, apart from saying that that also is a really hopeful, uh, hopeful information. So finally, in terms of uh, the services for researchers and data managers, um, Basically, what we also try to do is figure out what, what do people actually want from Area Any Plus in, in terms of the portal, in terms of services, and what kind of what the priorities were and in terms of what we could actually do. And what was good is that we had we got confirmation that the direction that we had gone in Ariadne was the right direction and that there was appreciation for the services as they existed. Um, here is a list of the newer enhanced services that people said that they really wanted. Um, unfortunately, vocabulary and alignment and mapping, which Julian's gonna talk, talk more about, didn't get as much love. I think it's, it's quite hard work, but it's very important. Um, but I will end on this slide, which I think is absolutely fascinating. So in green, we've got all of the existing services that were created as part of Ariadne, uh, which is fantastic that they are still at the top. They are still the things that people say that, say that were the most important. So new or enhanced are things that are already in being worked on as part of Ariadne Plus. So these things are basically in train now. So great to see such high ratings for the things that we are already working on. But what I'm fascinated by is the blue. So the potential future items that have come up on this list, where uh, which are post a picture of an object and get suggestions for similar ones, Pro process many documents using NLP, natural language processing, to find these on certain topics or specific information they may contain. So what this is saying to me is for Ariadne++ or wherever Ariadne goes after this, uh, 
we're hearing loud and clear that what people want is more uh, AI and machine learning and, and things like that, which really surprised me, um, but is very interesting. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there and hand it over to Julian so he can talk to you about uh, aggregation. Thanks. Okay, thanks Holly very much. I can just share my screen now. Right. Um, yeah, so um, Holly has nicely sort of the background of the user needs which have really driven the development of data aggregation within uh, Ariadne. And I'm going to say a little bit more about how we've gone about that. So I think it does provide a nice sort of case study really for, for shock and for EOSC of um, a specific community. Uh, and the reason why archaeology is, I think, a good case study is some of the opportunities that it provides. Um, firstly, that uh, the discipline has been from the outset an early adopter of IT. I started out using punch cards in, in that, and uh, we've gone through every storage device since then. Um, but also it's uh, cross-sectoral. It's the research done in archaeology is not confined to the academic sector. A lot of the actual field work is done either according to which country you're in by governmental organizations or commercial organizations. So we have to work uh, across multiple sectors. As Holly already uh, showed with that brilliant word cloud uh, slide, we've got a, a rich variety of data types. But comparatively, we do have relatively well developed ontologies and data standards. So, so relatively, that's maybe they're well developed for the arts and humanities. Uh, but in some countries in particular, there's been a lot of investment gone up over the years into development of thesauri and controlled uh, vocabularies. And as will already be obvious, my sort of fifth point there is that archaeology is a very interdisciplinary subject by uh, definition and really reaches across the social sciences in some aspects, the, the, the physical and chemical biological sciences, uh, but often with arts and humanities goals. So it sort of has to be interoperable across a very broad range of disciplines by definition. Um, but So those are opportunities, but there are lots of challenges as well. Um, and one of the goals of Ariadne has been to try and make data more accessible uh, because it's a very mixed picture uh, across uh, Europe. And of course, with the issues that come from the data I've mentioned, there are lots of challenges for data integration uh, of developing interoperability uh, between different uh, vocabularies, um, linking across different types of data sets and uh, really a sort of fragmented landscape of repositories um, and particularly well, is in effect the sort of haves and have nots. So There's some countries where repositories have become relatively well established. Um, for others where they've really only just realized that the lack of a repository is, is indeed a problem and that they need to uh, invest in that. But a lot of the, why we want to do this, a lot of it comes down to the fact that a lot of archeological research questions require you to search across borders and require you to search across multiple data sets and, and repositories. If uh, you're interested in whether it's the Bronze Age or the Viking Age, as I happen to, to be, you can't just research it using, uh, very adequately anyway, for using resources from just one uh, country. And modern political boundaries make little uh, sense if you're um, mapping the progress of, of, of different burial rites, for example, or settlement forms uh, across Europe. So, uh, Ariadne, in response to the user needs, has uh, since the outset been trying to join up some of these fragmentary resources. And the, and the primary visible way we do that is through the, uh, the Ariadne uh, portal. Um, but uh, alongside those, those aims, then there's, there's an underlying one of, of capacity and community building in the, in the sector uh, to try and address this issue of haves and, and have-nots. Um, but then 
to enable researchers to find data in the first place, to enable cross-border, cross-institution resource discovery. Uh, but then having done that, to enable interoperability across partners, countries, data types, data schemas. And it's that really that will uh, enable us to do um, more research, different types of research and, and better research. It's always a good idea to uh, decide at the outset how we will know whether we've succeeded or, or not. Some of these measures are inevitably purely quantitative. The, the number of records that we have in the area and the catalogue, we're now approaching 1.5 million. I anticipate we'll be well over 5 million be, before we reach the end of the current phase. Uh, the number of countries represented, which I've already mentioned. But obviously more important is the qualitative measures that we get good, meaningful search results. And particularly in Ariadne Plus, this goes down much more to level of granularity to enable interoperability, not just at collection level, but at item level. So we're looking at uh, interoperability, for example, across individual artifacts, not just at sites, um, individual dates, not just uh, databases of dates, individual graves, not just cemeteries. Um, and particularly, uh, we're expanding, particularly in the sort of heritage science area, in, which is involving integrating a lot of new data types. So overall, the, the key uh, success measure will have to be the quantity and quality of reuse, the R of the FAIR principles, uh, both bringing new users and new forms of research. Okay, so uh, how are we going about it? Well, the two main interfaces to this, uh, this cloud of linked open data, um, the portal uh, underpinned by the, the catalogue, and this works by harvesting um, initially collection level metadata, uh, but also increasing in our item level data and the ontologies that link them together uh, with links to the actual primary resources in the distributed repositories across the world. Um, so the underlying principle is that we don't try and bring all the data together. We just make it uh, findable by bringing the metadata uh, together uh, and the data is looked after uh, where it is best looked after by the, the under the national uh, regimes of the, the countries or regions where it's held. Over the years we've developed the idea that really the combination of the what, when, where questions is a relative, well, is a very powerful tool that allows you to uh, meet a large number of archaeological uh, research questions. Uh, so what was found in a particular place, what, what when it dates to what period it is, and, and where uh, in geospatial coordinates it was found. And one of the things we're working on, particularly at the moment, in response to one of the user needs issues is enhanced map-based searching and enhanced queries specific to, to certain data types. So that's the human interface, but also we are using the linked data, uh, developing APIs for machine based interfaces, uh, which will just mirror what's uh, the data that's in the catalog. And will also allow other organizations to implement their own portal or service, drawing on aspects of the um, Ariadne infrastructure. So as we mentioned, that's, that's uh, the aim, that's the uh, what we want to do. The, the challenges are, I mentioned, the heterogeneity of the of the data we're dealing with sites, with reports, with finds, with data sets, and now increasingly a wider range of, of data types and, and more domains. Uh, on top of that, there's, there's been no sort of top-down standard imposed since the beginning of archaeology. These are, although the standards are relatively well developed, they tend to be national uh, ones or even regional ones. Uh, and of course, to do international research, we also have to address this, this challenge of multilingualism. So the solutions to that, well, first of all, we need to make sure we are meeting the user needs. And Holly's already spoken extensively about that. Uh, but we've also taken a pragmatic approach to data availability and uh, focused initially on what 
I'd call the low hanging fruit data types where we have a critical mass of item level data across multiple data providing partners so they can at an early stage see the benefit of um, bringing things together uh, things like site reports uh, information about sites and, and finds and we call these sort of various Ariadne subjects or sort of basic uh, semantic categories but Underpinning this is a long established ontology of sort of data model, which I'm sure many will be familiar with, the, the CDOC CRM, which provides an object oriented data structure and shows how these different uh, data types and different semantic categories are interrelated. And then we tackle the, the what, the when, and the where by uh, three different solutions. Uh, for the what, we found that the most of the individual uh, subject vocabularies uh, that are employed in the different countries can all be mapped to the Getty Art and Architecture thesaurus, which goes down to a, a very granular uh, level. And of course, we're often mapping concepts rather than specific words, but it seems to work pretty well. Um, and every partner that supplies data to Ariadne, when they use a subject term, drawn from their own vocabularies, they have to say what it maps to in the Getty AAT. And this, this approach of mapping to a common spine avoids us having to create multiple uh, way mappings between every European uh, language to every other language, because we uh, agreed that the Getty AAT would provide that spine. The second area of, of when uh, has always been a very contentious one in, in, in archaeology. And it's become a bit of a joke that archaeologists can never agree when the, for example, the Bronze Age was, because uh, they each have their different theories. And indeed, some of these are linked to um, interpretations and theories about, for example, when the, uh, the, the Mesolithic period gave way to farming and the, the Neolithic, which is key to discussions of human evolution. Um, but here we join forces with an American uh, consortium funded by the NEH, uh, Periodo, um, where archaeologists can agree to disagree as long as they define what their period terms mean. So it, it provides URIs for definitions of when each archaeologist believes the Bronze Age actually started and finished in absolute uh, years. So again, when a data provider uh, submits their data set to Ariadne and they say these sites are Bronze Age, they will have had to have said, well, for me, that starts in X numbers of years uh, BC and finishes at another set year BC. The spatial side is probably the easiest one. Here we, we adopt latitude, longitude, conforming to the WGS 84 standard. So again, those providing data have to say uh, where their resources are located. And then as we move on to much more item level work, uh, we are developing a series of application profiles, which are effectively subsets of the CDOC CRM uh, that meet the research needs of particularly subdomains, such as, for example, at random paleoanthropology or ancient DNA, um, environmental archaeology, remote sensing, and, and, and so forth. So I'll just um, uh, illustrate what this looks like in the, in the uh, existing uh, portal, which is is now being redeveloped and enhanced, but retains the same uh, uh, where, when, and what structure. And you can see those sort of three options along the bottom there. But also a, a Google-like type and hope search in the in the box at the at the top, uh, which, as you start typing in, uh, gives intelligent suggestion of what you might be interested in drawn from the, the Getty terms and we're extending that, that now with multilingual terms so you choose which language you, you're working in uh, but for example I started to type out brooch and it's come up with some suggestions of what I might be interested in uh, and I selected ring brooches and in this case it's come up with a number of uh, results uh, which on the face of it might not look particularly relevant for ring brooches, but if I drill down into uh, one of those resources, here you'll see a particular information about a particular excavation report uh, on some 
uh, field work done at RAF Le Lake and Heath, and there you can see in the the, the metadata, uh, ring brooches is one of the terms that's been identified as something that was found on that uh, site. And the, these terms may be derived from natural language processing or from uh, human supplied uh, metadata and cataloging and indexing of the of the report. But we can uh, click on the sorry, click on the that I link there if we want to know what what we mean by a ring brooch, um, and there it takes us to the Getty AAT ID and where it's been translated into other languages. You'll see the different terms. Uh, uh, that are used there. And we, or rather our partners in University of South Wales have developed a vocabulary matching tool, a session meant to be about tools, this is a particularly useful tool, um, which shows how partners can map their own source vocabulary on the left here, drawn in this case from the UK, fish, archaeological objects, thesaurus, and map the term to the appropriate term in the in the Getty vocabulary. So this makes it a relatively easy process for partners to uh, do their vocabulary map, mapping. Um, so that was what, where is, as I say, in a sense, uh, easier. We provide a, a, a heat map which allows us to search across uh, borders to bring together collections from different countries. Uh, so here, uh, drilling down, and I actually drilled down to uh, part of uh, of Northern Ireland, um, but it's pulling together some resources drawn inevitably from uh, the ADS, uh, but also interestingly resources from our partner in the Netherlands, DANS, who hold uh, information about scientific, in particular dendrochronology dates, which will be in this case I imagine for Irish bog oats. So it's allowing researchers to pull together information about sites with dating evidence. And then finally, the uh, the when uh, search. Uh, and again, this is represented graphically by a, a, a chart showing, and this basically shows where in terms of all the 1.5 million records, where the concentrations are in terms of dating and sites. So it's an interesting research tool in its own right. Um, but as well as searching in absolute, years, we also allow searching by uh, subject terms, because it's an important distinction because, and there's a reason why archaeologists don't uh, agree when the Bronze Age is, because of course the Bronze Age does have different dates in different countries. It's a cultural stage of cultural evolution, and the Bronze Age in, in England isn't the same to that in Scotland, or indeed in France or in Germany. Um, so, but you might be interested in what was going on in different parts of, of Europe during the Bronze Age. So this would allow us uh, to uh, search across a particular uh, period term and pull all those things together. Uh, and this is the, the Periodo site that supports the searching in absolute uh, years. Uh, and to show you there the, the definitions of period terms which we draw upon. Uh, from their own linked open data uh, gazetteer. So uh, that really just in a, in a nutshell is uh, what we're doing to uh, enable interoperability in, in Ariadne. So I'll stop sharing uh, there. And I think we can, don't know if there are any uh, comments that have been Added Wolfgang's hopefully um, added some links, and he says, "Could you say a bit more about uh, D4 Science as, as a VRE?" I can say a little bit more, um, but this is uh, so far we've mainly been using D4 Science as a as a management tool, and what we're doing now is moving on to using it as a research tool and early in 2021, we're aiming to hold a couple of workshops um, of the, uh, the archaeological partners, actually, because it's essential really that they drive the development of the VREs. Uh, we can get the technical partners in CNR to um, talk about what the VREs are capable of uh, and show us some of the tools. So for example, there are uh, GIS tools that have already been deployed in the VRE. 
uh, but we're going to be holding these workshops to see well what research questions would archaeologists want to uh, implement in a VRE. So the idea is that people would navigate from the portal having discovered some uh, data sets drawn from multiple partners they were interested in, uh, they would be able to uh, download them into their own research space in VRE and then deploy tools uh, that exist in the VRE that they've co-designed uh, to interrogate those uh, data sets which could involve some uh, mapping or 3D uh, visualization if the data supports that. Um, so on. So does that uh, uh, help a little bit? It's a bit early days really. Yeah, thank you. No. to answer any other questions? I think we've got four minutes left if anyone uh, submits. Can I answer the API question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Would you like to? Because you know more no. about what's going on with the APIs yeah. than I do. So well, well, let me read the question. Are there already examples of other people imprinting their own services around the area and the data? Uh, there are in the sense that the um, developers, current developers of the area and the portal, uh, SND, uh, are, uh, in a sense, they are testing some of the, uh, the Ariadne uh, portal uh, development with their own catalogue. So there will be a great similarity for Swedish users between going to the SND portal and going to the, uh, the Ariadne uh, portal. Uh, we're also looking at it, I should say that we've made no decision yet, from an ADS perspective uh, for using it for uh, uh, our uh, catalogue. Um, so I think there are some advantages in, in providing archaeological users wherever they're from with a, a sort of similar sort of interface and building on the work that they indeed started out in the, the DAI in, in Germany with Wolfgang's colleagues and then has been built on by SND. It is a I think quite a powerful tool which uh, a lot of users have, have found both quite easy uh, but also um, uh, quite intuitive and, and easy to get fast results. Uh, thanks for that, that question. Should we bring it to a close? Yeah, I think so. I think we're, we're, we're just in within time. But, uh, thank you very much then, uh, everyone, for your uh, attendance. Uh, thank you, Anna, for facilitating uh, this. And enjoy the rest of the uh, of the meeting. Bye, everyone. Thank you both. Bye. 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 Bye.